He uh, was the managing editor, and he was a member of the Glee Club. He had a fantastic voice. At one point, uh, he was even thinking of becoming an opera star. He had uh, had some lessons in singing from a Metropolitan Opera coach. Um, he was a member of not only he was a secretary treasurer in the Dramatic Society, uh, the Kane Spree champion. Kane Spree was an annual athletic event, men only. That's what uh, Stevens Institute year, uh, was a men's school. It was limited. Now it has women as well. There is no more Kane Spree annual gathering. But uh, the Kane would be grabbed by two people, two competitors. Hold, held on to, and at uh, the start, when a whistle blew, each uh, competitor would try to wrest the cane from the other, and Fred was, as they ha has indicated at the bottom of the first paragraph, uh, the heavyweight can spree champion twice. At the age of 20, while he was in college, he thought about his own life and his own future, and he had a di kept a diary. And he confided in his diary that his ultimate and prophetic ambition was, quote, I'd like to discover one little thing and build my career around it. It's unclear that he had ever heard of a neutrino at that point. Uh, e equals MC square uh, is commonly thought of as the most famous uh, equation in the universe. And the universe? Well, we'll say in the, in the world, this world that we live in. Um, but uh, it is... Um, it stands for energy, uh, and it equals uh, mass times the speed of light, C is the speed of light, squared. Now, Albert Einstein uh, first proposed this in 1905 as a kind of theoretical exercise that you could just take a very, very, very small amount of uh, material or matter, and if you could um, suffuse the energy that would come from it, the transference, that mass and energy uh, in effect can convert from one to the other. And you could get a huge amount of energy out. And at the same time, there was an understanding that in 1938, when a German laboratory demonstrated that you could, through some chemical reactions, actually create a lot of energy from a very small amount of uranium, uh, and when you look at the, uh, the huge amount of, of energy that would come from this formula, you would note, of course, that C squared, C speed of light is about 186,000 miles per second. Square that, and you know the huge amount of energy that at least theoretically could be converted into an atomic bomb. And that, in 1939, with an understanding uh, just before uh, World War II began that the uh, that event proof of proof uh, of uh, how this could re uh, turn into huge energy and possibly an atomic weapon, a letter was sent by a, a bunch of physicists with uh, Einstein's backing uh, that uh, uh, the the U.S. ought to prepare itself and get into some kind of program that could end up that we should have an atomic bomb. Uh, which would match what was anticipated that Germany might do. It ends up that in 1945, uh, the uh, bomb did come to fruition in July. You'll see a little bit about that in a moment. Um, and then it was, a, of course, a secret, but then used against two Japanese cities, Hiroshima and uh, Nagasaki, because uh, Germany and Italy, who had been uh, the Axis powers along with Germany, they had already surrendered, and Japan seemed bent on continuing to maintain the war against America and other allied forces. So with that, Fred witnessed the very first Trinity atomic bomb test, July 16th. Uh, a couple of months after the war was over, he, uh, which was September 1st or 2nd, depending on which side of the earth you were on, uh, the Japanese surrendered. And um, but he went back to write a piece on uh, this, what he witnessed to his uh, college uh, alumni journal. This was absolutely the most awe-inspiring spectacle man has yet created on this earth. Even though we who worked on the test preparations knew what to expect in the way of a spectacle, we were left gasping by the magnificent sight that spread out before us. 
While working at Los Alamos, which was where he and Sylvia, his wife, um, uh, spent uh, from 1944 on through after the war till 1959, um, Ted teamed up with Clyde Cowan, a colleague there, and uh, they uh, uh, theorized uh, that they could actually detect what seemed to be an undetectable particle, subatomic particle. That was first, uh, the neutrino was theorized in 1930 as a necessary ingredient uh, in the conversion of uh, matter into uh, energy and energy into mass. Uh, that, that one of the, uh, the chemical reactions that they were working on, the, the scientists then in the 30s and such, suggested that uh, the energy equals mass formula um, wasn't quite balanced. You were getting a little less energy out, coming out than you thought was the case. So, so the theoretical difference was called a neutrino, tiny particles. So in order to detect them, which had never been done before, some people were convinced that you could never detect them, um, they built this smallish uh, detector called Herr Aug. You can see that written on the top. Uh, that's uh, Mr. I in German. And you see that it, uh, it contains about three tons of liquid and 90 photomultipliers. The photomultipliers are those uh, bulky little items that you see surrounding uh, the tank. The purpose of a photomultiplier is that uh, if a neutrino, and there are trillions of them that are passing every second, if just one of them happened to react in there, then you would get a photomultiplier to multiply the light effect that the signal that they uh, devised uh, would have been um, visible. Now that detector didn't work, and here's what happened. Uh, while they were working on the neutrino and while previously uh, Fred uh, was in, at Los Alamos and then later on when he went to other schools uh, in various positions, he was always performing. And here he is in Los Alamos uh, at a rehearsal for Inherit the Wind. Those of you of a certain age will remember Inherit the Wind, the monkey trial, 1925, about whether uh, everything comes from the Bible or human beings evolved in some kind of uh, scientific manner. Clarence Darrow was one of the greatest attorneys of his day in civil rights. And he is, as you see from a local uh, newspaper in Los Alamos, Clarence Darrow is played by Fred Rhinus. It said, Rhinus is world famous for his co-discovery of the neutrino. His stage experience includes the romantic lead in Finian's Rainbow and many appearances in Gilbert and Sullivan productions. Uh, an example of Fred's poetry, it ranged from uh, the whimsical, viva la difference, curves, figure, insects, and manner, complex. The impulse, the action, the core of attraction is concavity meeting convex. He wrote hundreds of poems. Another one was called Mad. It has some uh, resonance with today's concerns about uh, what's happening uh, in Ukraine and the, the threat from Russia about re uh, reaching up to a possible nuclear weapon use. Um, for in the 1960s and 70s, the, the United States and Russia, or then the Soviet Union, had uh, thousands of nuclear weapons. We still have some thousands uh, between the two of us, but at a lower number than previously. The theory was called MAD, M-A-D, for mutual assured destruction, that no one would dare or want to use it knowing that they would be destroyed in turn. So I would just say uh, what brought us to the brink was the beginning of an excerpt from his poem. And uh, you can see that uh, in the last three lines here, can we searching find our way out of this damn maze toward an earth suffused with love to a brotherhood of man. So while he had worked on what turned out to be a horrible tar uh, potential weapons, uh, the, that at the same time, there's uh, an underlying um, uh, affection for him for the notion that we somehow can get out of it and have an appreciation of the best of our behaviors. Okay, Fred was a whistler in the early 60s. I'm just going to give you a brief sample of this. Um, he accompanied his daughter. She was on the... 
She was playing the guitar in the background. Now I'm going to move this along. He used that whistling in uh, walking down hallways and his, near his offices at the same time he uh, would use it in his classroom. I spoke to one of his students who said we he would sometimes sing opera in class for uh, to make a point somehow. Now, as I mentioned earlier that he was uh, singing opera and loved it, and I'm just going to play a, a, a small excerpt of 1965 when he moved to from um, Los Alamos in 1959, he moved uh, to become chairman of the physics department at Case Institute in Cleveland. And uh, there, when he got to, to Cleveland, he put in an application to sing with the Cleveland Orchestra Chorus, one of the most outstanding uh, orchestras in the world. Uh, George Sell was the conductor then, and the associate conductor was a great uh, chorus and chorale teacher named Robert Shaw. Uh, many of you have, I'm sure, remember, remember the Robert Shaw chorale. And uh, Fred auditioned, and without asking for him to come back, they wanted to, they brought him in on the spot to a, about a hundred people were volunteer professionals. And he sang with the Cleveland Orchestra chorus uh, for a little more than three years, three and a half years or so. I couldn't get a sound of the time that he was there, but I could Google and get a 1965 sound of the Cleveland Orchestra Chorus, and this is what Fred would have sounded like with that chorus at the time. Okay, you heard the quality of that is uh, fantastic. And um, although Fred worked with a colleague to do the original discovery of the uh, neutrino, that was where the um, neutrino were being emitted uh, by uh, nuclear reactors. So it was a man-made production. But in the uh, 1960s, Fred's work included experiments in a laboratory more than two miles underground in South Africa. And the findings included the detection in 1965 of natural neutrinos that were streaming from the Earth's atmosphere. You can see the conditions of what it looks like in an under, deep underground mine. Why did he have to go so deep underground to find them? Because cosmic rays are constantly bombarding. You heard that in the book trailer up front. Uh, they're bombarding the uh, Earth. And, uh, and uh, if uh, you just use the uh, detector on the surface of the Earth, uh, you can get confusing signals that, are, that mimic something close to what a neutrino would signal. So they had to get to a point where uh, the, there was sufficient uh, material uh, above the, the laboratory or the detector so that uh, you would not have interference from cosmic rays, which were stopped before they had could get that deep neutrinos though just keep passing through as if as in, in the case of your thumbnail it uh it, nothing solid would uh, stop them except on very very rare occasions when there would be a reaction on the left you see the photograph of fred next to uh, one of the people who worked with him in his neutrino group at uh, cleveland now, the, this is the detector that ultimately was used fairly near to a uh, nuclear power po point, uh, which does emit man-made neutrinos. Just to give you a sense and difference of size, 
It contains five tons of liquid and 110 photomultipliers. Note those numbers. You're looking at one of the original um, neutrino detectors uh, that Fred had created. Five tons of liquid, 110 photomultipliers. Today, as we talk, uh, and there are a couple of people from Irvine, they may well have seen this, I suppose they have, uh, in the wall, it's a 40 foot tall wall. And uh, as you look to the right, you will see uh, in the, uh, the lobby of the uh, Rhinus Hall, called it's named after him, it contains 50,000 tons of liquid and 11,000 multipliers. I'm going to show you now a, uh, a vision, a visual of uh, the Super K, Super Kamiokande detector in Japan. Hank Sobel, I hope, will mention something about it. He is the representative of the Super K here in the United States. And uh, he has also helped tremendously along the time that I was writing the book, as did a couple of others who you will hear from in a minute. But first, I just wanted to see if you are as awed as I am, and I think as most people would be, by, in effect, the beauty of these detectors. Let me get this going. Super Kamio Kande. A huge and beautiful instrument for physics experiments that helps reveal the history of the universe and the origin of matter itself. Numerous discoveries have been made at Super Kamiokande, including those which led to the 2015 Nobel Prize in Physics. Now it is taking the next step in its evolution in order to continue the legacy of breakthroughs in physics. The instrument contains approximately 11,000 photomultiplier tubes. These sensors, immersed in ultra-pure water and isolated beneath 1,000 meters of rock, can detect incredibly faint bursts of light. This is the key to finding neutrinos. One source of large amounts of neutrinos is supernovas, the explosive deaths of stars. Another source is within our own star, the sun, as it produces energy. In addition, cosmic rays from deep space passing through the Earth's atmosphere create showers of neutrinos. Even though we are constantly bombarded by vast numbers of neutrinos, most pass right through all matter in their path, making them tricky to detect. In fact, trillions of neutrinos pass through the palm of your hand every second. These neutrino observations have contributed to great scientific accolades. Professor Kajita, for the discovery of neutrinos. In 2015, the Nobel Prize for Physics was awarded for the discovery of neutrino oscillation, which shows that neutrinos have mass. Uh, well, I showed you that because although Fred um, was not part of the uh, creation of uh, the Super Kamiokande, he was definitely being informed by two uh, of the neutrino experts, part of what was called Fred's uh, neutrino group, uh, that uh, helped me along with the book. One of the individuals is Bill Kropp, who died shortly before the book was published. And the other, again, I mentioned uh, is Hank Sobel. Um, and he might have something to say about this. But you saw the individual who received the, the most recent Nobel Prize, uh, or one of the two individuals, that was uh, uh, Professor Kajita from Japan. And uh, the other is Arthur McDonald, uh, who is uh, worked with an American a team. Some of uh, the people who had worked with on Fred's neutrino team worked for that. It's a similar kind of a, of huge, magnificent, giant uh, underground, deep underground a detector that was used. But I wanted to um, read to you a little bit from the very beginning of the book, very briefly, 
Um, it's about the Super K image that you see on the cover of the book. Uh, and uh, Takaki Kajita, who was the Nobel Prize winner, uh, did uh, have a chance to make a comment about the book and about Fred Rhinus. Uh, he, like Rhinus, a Nobel laureate, received the prize for his neutrino findings on the Super K in 2015. And he pays homage to Fred Rhinus's. Can they see me? Uh, I just wanted to hold this as I read it. Um, yeah, they can, they can see you. I'll show you. Okay, hold on for a sec. They see you right here. Yeah. Okay, here's, here's the book. Here's the cover. And uh, he said, this book, he said about chasing the ghost, is a most welcome account about Frederick Rhinus and his great, his great contributions to neutrino physics and astrophysics. And he said that detectors that are used today, in, like the Super K, are really giant derivations of, from the principles uh, established way back when Fred Rhinus and uh, Clyde Cowan developed the very first neutrino detector. So with that, I think uh, we still have some time to go. I'm very sorry for the interruptions that we had. That was exciting. And I just quickly want to say it, it amazes me that uh, not too long ago, some months back, uh, U.S. scientists through NASA were able to send a rocket ship to Mars, 200 million miles away. And precisely at a certain point uh, after it landed, uh, release a helicopter, a minor, a, a mini helicopter in an atmosphere that's 1% the density of that on Earth. And it amazes me that this helicopter then could be steered and picked up and land uh, at the will of individuals here. And yet we don't seem to have yet a smooth capability to fix the technical fixes that would be necessary <laughs> without interruption for a simple message going out to a bunch of people. So somebody maybe can explain that to me someday. Take the presentation off. Yeah, take it off now. All right. So hello again. Um, I'm going to ask for the is is uh, Ken Ford here? Where are you, Ken? If you're there, I'm here. Oh yes, there you are. Good to see. Oh, and Joanne, how are you? Okay. All right. Ken, I'm glad to see you. I have to say that Ken Ford was one of the backbones for giving me information. And I think uh, whatever credits have come to the book in large measure come from him and Hank Sobel, who are, is also on. Uh, and uh, Ken knew Fred initially back in 1947 when he, uh, I'll let him explain uh, what he- well, remember. It was 1950, but go ahead. Oh, well, three years. Uh, at, okay. <laughs> I thought it was 47 that you first got out there. Oh, no, that was Harris Mayer. Okay, sorry. Ken, Ken, tell us a little bit about Fred and uh, your experience with him. Well, I met Fred, I was 24 years old uh, on leave for my graduate study at Princeton and working on the hydrogen bomb development at Los Alamos. Uh, Fred was not a lot older. He was probably still in his 20s, maybe 30 years old. He was um, active in in uh, instrumenting tests for nuclear explosions. In any case, I got to know Fred and like him a lot. And uh, lived next door. He lived next door. Well, late, later on, we were <laughs> next door neighbors. But at that time, uh, I was just impressed by his. My, how can I put it? He he was different from the or, ordinary person. He was. Uh, uh, he had a strong personality, a lovable person. You, you, you referred already to his singing, and uh, he'd break forth in song at the slightest uh, inclination. But he, above all, he was intensely curious. He was interested in everything, uh, not just physics, but everything you can imagine uh, would elicit questions and, and uh, further discussion with him. Right. Well, yes, he did. Um... I knew him uh, as a child, and I just remember I'm, uh, that uh, every time that I would meet him, even when I was eight, nine, ten years old, 
uh, he elicited a certain excitement. He was just a hugely charismatic guy. Um, so thank you for your comment. And uh, Hank, where are you? Hank Sobel? I hope you're still with us. Yeah, I'm, I'm here. I'm okay. Yeah, there you are. That's that famous office picture that I took of you. Okay. <laughs> Tell yeah, us about your experience with him. Well, in 1961, I was an uh, undergraduate. I was taking a nuclear physics course in my undergraduate school at, at RPI, upstate New York. And I had, we had to write a, uh, a thesis. It was a I was a junior at that time. I had to write a thesis. And uh, neutrinos had just been discovered. His paper came out a few years before that. So I decided to write a paper on the neutrino discovery. And I read the paper and I had questions. So I sent Fred a letter asking him questions about the paper. And he wrote back with an application to graduate school. Well, that's how I ended up at Case, going to graduate school there. So uh, being a graduate student of Fred's was, um, was different. He, was, he worked all the time. So he would call you at 3 o'clock in the morning with a question and want you to work on something. Um, we, I got there. I, I went into graduate school. It was 1962. And by 1965, we were ready to build our experiment in South Africa. So uh, he sent me to South Africa. And I lived there with my wife for three and a half years, working underground in that mine every day. And then came back and he hired me as a postdoc. And then I went on to be a faculty member at UCI. So his, his influence on me, of course, was tremendous. And his influence on the field was also tremendous. He, he started, as was mentioned in that program, looking for neutrinos in every possible way you can find them, wherever the sources were. So neutrinos from nuclear reactors, from the Earth's atmosphere, from the sun, from other stars, neutrino astronomy. <clears throat> he, start, he started all that. And right now, there's thousands of physicists working in this area all, all around the world. So he has a legacy that uh, certainly continues. So when he went fishing with Daddy, he was looking for neutrinos, wasn't he? Yeah. Um, Hank, can you tell us a little bit about your impression of, as you mentioned it to me, of the Super K? You stood at the bottom of that huge uh, open area which looked to me by the way as if uh, in some way when you're down at the bottom and it's as if you're looking up to the top of a 13 story or a 15 story building yeah. and seeing stars in every direction that you look those are the photomultipliers yeah it sort of reminded me of a crystal cathedral looking up and seeing all those amber colored bulbs surrounding you it's it's enormous i mean it's really enormous it's yeah 40 meters high so What's extraordinary is that not only are most people unaware of the existence of neutrinos or what value they may have, uh, and I can mention that in a moment, but uh, that people don't realize that underground, and I mean a couple of miles underground, and I, as I wrote in the book from the descriptions that you and uh, Bill Kropp gave me, that it could take, in the course of a workday, if uh, you're crowded in with the miners in an, uh, an elevator, a cage elevator, and then you have to transfer to some carts that go at 45 degree angles down. So you've traveled a couple of miles just to get down there. You're, uh, you're, you're talking about the experiment in South Africa. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Okay. South Africa, and you were, as you said, you led that, uh, that experiment for a while. It was down at over 11,000 feet underground. Yeah. And so there was a vertical elevator of 4,000 feet and then uh, three hours, three 45 degree incline elevators of around 2,000 feet each. Right. At, at the bottom of the vertical, you had to walk about a mile to get to the next place where you go down and uh, wait. And then you go down the next one and the next one and the next one. And so it takes, you know, it could take you an hour or more to get underground. Right. 
And well, of course, it was terribly hot. It was 123 degrees rock temperature down there. So we had to wear special clothing called pneumo jackets to keep us from getting sick. So yeah, it was a very interesting experience. Interesting time when for I, young I was, I was young and stupid, so I wasn't afraid oh, at the time. Yeah, you, know, you were never stupid. Okay. Um, well, I, I relate that to the Super K. Uh, it's not as difficult to get to the bottom there. I know you can drive that, but that also is deep within a within a mountain in order to uh, shield away from cosmic rays being able to get down to that. Yeah, it's very different. It's a horizontal access. Yeah. So we have yeah. a tunnel you just drive in much, much easier, much more comfortable. I can imagine. Um, but beautiful. And how many people know, I'm not going to ask for show of hands, I would bet very few would understand that either deep within a mountain or deep underground today, uh, there are uh, these magnificent structures and there's one on the way uh, that uh, I think is going to be, uh, is it the, the hyper Kamehokande? And yeah, we're building the next version, which is about nine, nine times bigger than the one you saw in the picture, uh, believe, it, believe it or not. Nine times larger. That would be yeah. quite incredible. All right. So that, that's great. And I thank you. And I, I think George and Ann Miller, do you have anything you'd uh, like to say now? about your experience with Fred or Sylvia, his wife? We have relatively uh, little to add. I think you covered things very well in your excellent book, so that having browsed through it, um, we kind of reaffirm all of the things that we knew about Fred, how friendly he was. We have the one incident where he had hosted some sort of picnic for the whole um, department, uh, not the department, the school, <laughs> And sure enough, as we were trying to get our hot dogs or whatever out in Bomber Canyon, everybody realized that uh, Fred had uh, corralled all of the young kids of which our own two were involved and was telling them stories. And they were all sitting around in a cluster while all of us adults were off drinking and eating. Uh, and that was so typical of him to be interested in the young folks and pulling those into that particular uh, kind of way. I must say that since I operate the nuclear reactor at UCI, not only do I appreciate people measuring neutrinos, I also create a lot um, and add to the pool, uh, actually relatively insignificant to the pool coming from the sun, but still. Uh, so when my reactor runs, and there was another physics faculty member for a while called Joe Weber, who would uh, claim to have uh, a miniature kind of detector rather than this massive things that we've just been hearing about. And he asked me to let him know anytime I turned my reactor on and turned it off. Uh, and he would sit in his office and see if he could pick up the neutrinos coming from it. So many people, at, particularly at UCI, have certainly been involved in trying to do this. I personally ran some samples for um, the people in the Kamioka uh, project uh, when they were worried about water leaking and looking for gadolinium, which they had doped the water with and things like this. And also, uh, I think uh, Hank will appreciate that at one point they were thinking of building a, an underground thing under the local mountains in Southern California. And mm -hmm. we did analyze some chips to see just kind of what the background levels might be under such a device. Uh, they lost out on the contract to somewhere else, and he can certainly tell you more about that. So I've been kind of on the periphery of the neutrino project uh, ever since I've been at UCI, which is as long as Fred was. So I think that's about all. We appreciated, uh, I think Anne has a comment that appreciated meeting Sylvia early on uh, and working with her in the early version of the uh, Faculty Wives Association that she was involved with. So. And <laughs> I don't really have anything to add. I mean, Sylvia was a superb cook. And I'm sure her children can attest to the fact that she had file cabinets full of recipes, all <laughs> filed alphabetically. Okay. Um, uh, Martin Coleman, where are you? Martin, are you there? There I am. And, uh, there oh, there you are. Yes. Tell us a little bit about your. You told me that you, when he was in South Africa doing his experiment, you recall very well uh, that he was there when you were just a young student. 
Well, I was in medical school in the early 60s, and then I did a residency in radiation oncology in the late 60s. And uh, I can't remember exactly when I first heard about the project, but a lot of us knew about the project uh, and particularly being in the radiation field, we were very interested in it. And it was in, mentioned in the newspaper several times. There was some negative publicity about it at one point, as you mentioned in the book, allegations that these American scientists were building an atom bomb in the bottom of a South African gold mine, which of course was total nonsense. But um, I heard about the project then. I didn't know too much detail about it. And then uh, several years later, I was recruited to UC Irvine in 1977 in radiological sciences. I was the chief of radiation oncology and Fred Rhinus was on our graduate committee. Um, we, ran, we ran a PhD program in radiological sciences and it was absolutely incredible to meet Fred in person after hearing about him when I was in my early career and meet him in person in Irvine and get to know him on the committee. And what struck me about him when I first met him, he was a very imposing person. He had a deep baritone voice, and, but he was always interested in you. I mean, he would come and question me. I thought he was much more interesting than I was, and I wanted to know about his work, but he would ask me about my work. And I found that, you know, it was very, um, uh, I don't know what, how to put it, but he, he was very personable and very uh, a wonderful person to get to know over the years. And um, I was running an alumni group for our university in California, the University of the Waters in Johannesburg. And of course, I, I uh, took the opportunity with my personal connection with Fred to get him to come and talk at one of our alumni meetings about his experience with the university. The university had given him an honorary degree and he arrived at the, uh, at the alumni dinner wearing the tie for the ERPM mine where he had done the experiments. Um, the, the, the mine was known, as the, the ERPM were known as hooters because of the sirens that went off every evening at the mine, uh, denoting the end of the workday. And um, the, the emblem on the tie was an, an owl. And uh, he wore this tie to our dinner and he gave a wonderful talk about his experiences in Johannesburg. And then um, I had a very amusing incident with him. Every year at UC Irvine, uh, in, leading up to the Nobel Prizes, there'd be rumors running around campus that this year Fred was going to get the uh, Nobel Prize in physics. And each year when the prizes were announced, there was great disappointment. And um, uh, in about 19, it was the late 80s, I think it was about 1988, they just announced the prize again and Fred's name was not listed. And we were at a concert at um, the Barclay Theater, a chamber music concert. And in the intermission, uh, we ran into Fred and I was chatting to him. And I said to him, Fred, I think, am I right that every person who either postulated the existence of a subatomic particle or proved its existence uh, has won a Nobel Prize except you. And Fred just looked at me and his, his response was instantaneous. He just said, I'm not dead yet. Okay. <laughs> and of course, uh, a couple of years later, he yeah. was awarded the Nobel Prize, and we had big celebrations on campus when that happened. In fact, we got two Nobel Prizes the same day because Sherry Rowland won the Nobel Prize for chemistry the same day that Fred won the Nobel Prize for physics, and uh, there were huge celebrations at Irvine campus. Well, that, that's a lovely story. Thank you so much, Martin. And that, you and I spoke on the phone, and I mentioned to you that uh, I, you know, I interviewed uh, literally dozens and dozens of scientists. There were some 50 or so that I interviewed personally or worked from uh, things that they had written about Fred in the past. And one of them I mentioned was uh, Leroy Price, a name familiar to some of you uh, who had worked in, with Fred in the neutrino group. And Leroy said that in uh, early 1995, 
he had a conversation with Fred, who by then was a, a bit frail. Um, and uh, he mentioned to Fred uh, that uh, too bad uh, you haven't won the Nobel Prize, something of that sort, in a kind of empathetic way. And you heard a different conclusion from Fred, and I'm not dead yet, uh, than what Leroy reported hearing. And Leroy said, Fred seemed resolved by then to the likelihood that he was not ever going to get a Nobel Prize. And he recited the following, uh, that some people get the prize and they probably don't deserve it. And some don't get the prize uh, and I won't get it. And as Leroy said, he didn't seem angry or upset. He just seemed reconciled at that stage that he would never get it. That was in January or February of 1995. Lo and behold, in October, he got the announcement that he got the prize. So that was a, a much more pleasant ending than, uh, than Fred would have anticipated at that point. Uh, uh, if I can jump in very briefly, sure. uh, there's a story about that, that one of the uh, chemistry faculty called Sherry Rowland to say, have you heard the news? And uh, Sherry Rowland said, well, yes, I heard that Fred got the physics prize. That's fantastic. And the person said, no, you got the Nobel Prize. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I, and keep in mind, I guess the group doesn't realize it, that uh, you see at Irvine uh, was first established, I think, in 1965. So it was still a new school relative to uh, a lot of other famous institutions, Princeton, Harvard, they go back to ancient history. And here you have a, a school that's been in existence for a, oh, a couple of decades and two Nobel Prize winners in one year. That was that was quite a festivity. Uh, I, have, I have one other Nobel Prize story. Yeah. There was, a, there was a conference at CERN and at the time, well, the, you know, there, there was, that was CERN, it just mentioned what CERN is. It, it's a large accelerator complex uh, in Europe. In Europe, yeah. So, um, so there, there are three types of neutrinos in general, electron neutrino, muon neutrino, and tau neutrino. And at the time, no one seemed to be working on trying to discover or observe the tau neutrino. And so the theorist who was in, con in, in charge of the conference stood up and said, well, it's obvious. Everyone knows the Nobel Prize comes for every other neutrino. <laughs> yes. Uh, and you were, <laughs> that was cute. All right. Um, I just wanted to make one other quick comment. And then maybe if we have a few more minutes, uh, since we lost some of the time in the early part of the, the, the technical issue uh, period. Um, I had, uh, among other scientists that I talked to, a couple um, have said, uh, you know, uh, there is a, a concern that maybe uh, there's not a practical use for neutrino. You know, the Super K uh, detector cost $100 million. Other detectors are going to cost more as we go forward. You heard that there's going to be a, a hypercondiocomy. Uh, that's going to be nine times larger than the existing one that you saw. Uh, so one of the questions that I'm sure all the scientists here who have ever sought grants will, will get from the people who give the money, namely, presumably, from Congress or whoever signs off on the budgets uh, to NASA and other places. So what's the practical effect? What's the use? And uh, I heard a couple of answers to that. One of the most impressive answers was, you know, you ask the wrong question when you say, what is the practical use? Because sometimes there's no obvious practical use. And in a few years or maybe a few decades, what you have discovered turns into a major finding and a major uh, uh, unantici previously unanticipated use that uh, can change the world which is certainly the case, for example, with E equals MC squared and Einstein's original equation. Einstein himself said you can never use it for any practical purpose. It's never going to happen in real life. And lo and behold, you have uh, you have these accelerators, not the only accelerators, but you have these uh, uh, mechanisms for using uh, that knowledge for practical use in, in the nuclear uh, power plants and such. The other was a very interesting a comment was that 
don't ask for just practical use. There's an inherent value in having a cultural value as opposed to a practical value. And I then can say to any of us, if we didn't know scientifically from those who have studied and given us information uh, that uh, the earth is not the center of the universe, and it is certainly uh, not the center around which uh, the sun uh, rotate, revolves or r rotates, uh, you, uh, if you were like most of human life in history, until a couple of hundred years ago, you would see the sun rise in the morning at the east, and in the course of a day overhead, eventually sets in the west. And so when we often hear, oh, but you've, you've got to see with your own eyes in order to believe, if you saw that happening every day for enough times, uh, years in your life, wouldn't any of us, if you're a non-scientist, non-trained, not understanding the things that have been learned in the past couple of uh, decades, uh, that you would think that, well, that's, that's what the reality is. And uh, isn't it better in, in, in an inherently valued way that we understand the truth of, that the earth really does uh, rotate around the sun and that we and that it also uh, revolves in a way that doesn't seem to what's practical in a in, in a common sense notion so i leave that as what others have said i would like to ask one more person uh, who i met only by phone uh not too long ago Rich Rhinus, are you on now? Yes. You're muted. We can't hear you, Rich. Yep. Yeah, I'm. I'm here. C tell here us a little now. bit about your your uh, history. You were born in Patterson. Fred Rhinus was born in Patterson. Oh, I was. Yeah. Born in Patterson. Um, <laughs> you know, I I didn't really know know about Fred Rhinus. Uh, and my father, who was born in Patterson in 1916. Um, Excuse me. Fred was born in 1918, by the way, two years difference. Yeah. Oh, OK. I didn't know that. But um, I was born in uh, Patterson in 1949. And I, in high school, I, I heard a little about the, um, the neutrino. And I, I did a, a project of the. Uh, you know, looking into it a little more. And then I asked my father if he, he knew him and he didn't have any um, specific recollections, but he did say he, he grew up with him in, um, in the uh, Jewish ghetto area of uh, Patterson. He, he couldn't uh, give me any specific stories or I'm not sure I didn't ask him about that, but uh, he did know him from uh, growing up in Patterson in those uh, early 1900 days. Um, and, I, you know, that's, that's about all of my recollection of, of him. Yeah, I should mention uh, that Rich Rhinus, who is a physician now in Florida, uh, was all, an all-American swimmer for Tufts University when he was there. Did I get that right? Yeah, that, that's it. That was about 1970-1971. Yes, yeah. and I assume you, you did not get recognition from Fred Rhinus at that time because you, you didn't know him. Okay. I, I uh, did, you know, I did you write met? him when yeah. I was doing my project in high school. And um, I, I believe I did get uh, an answer uh, to a couple questions uh, I, I wrote to him. I, I knew... I think at that time he was, uh, you know, at the uh, UC UC campus, and he did write me back just a, a very short note. I wish I had kept it, but uh, yeah. I, you know, I I felt good that uh, you know I did this project and I got a uh, a response from uh, from him. Yeah, that was nice. Yeah, he he would write, and I would be in occasional communication with him. He was quite a guy. And uh, I'm so delighted and happy to have heard from 
several of you about your own experiences with Fred, and uh, it means a lot. Uh, Lou, did you want to say anything? Lou Chodash, Dr. Oh, Chodash? I just said about the book, but I would say what's striking about it is that you put such a human face on his scientific endeavors. And that's what I think made the book very readable, colorable, uh, colorful, and a pleasure to read. So uh, combining his uh, remarkable personal life together with his scientific accomplishments made the book something special. Well, uh, thanks. <laughs> okay. Yeah, uh, it was Fred who made the book special, and I, I just put the tools to it. Uh, and it was a terrific experience learning about it and meeting so many of you and uh, hearing your own stories. Terrific. May, uh, may, anybody may, else? may I make one other comment that I sure. mentioned? Um, yeah, we'll, we'll be signing off pretty soon, but go ahead. Um, well, this is something that I think Hank may know a lot more about than I, but um, in Fred's talk to our alumni group, he mentioned something really remarkable um, that the project in Johannesburg involved Case Institute, the University of Woodwaters-Rand, um, the mine, and, um, and the funding agencies, which I think was the uh, US Atomic Energy Agency. And he said there was not a single written contract. He said it was all done by communications and agreements and this multi-million dollars of equipment transferred from the US to South Africa down a mine and a project that ran for several years. Right. Fred had a lot of contacts from his times at Los Alamos. So yeah. he, he knew the head of the Atomic Energy Commission so he could get on the phone and call him up. Right. Uh, he And he did it many times. Yeah. Yeah, I've heard that from so many others who are not on here, who I've interviewed and talked to. Um, who was it who, who had mentioned that you remember him well, maybe it was George, that uh, as he would be walking, you knew in advance without seeing him if he's walking down the hallway toward your office, because usually you would hear either whistling or singing a Gilbert and Sullivan song of some sort. Uh, yes, he that's, just, that's, uh, that's correct. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Right. And I heard he also I one other vague anecdote. He would come to visit with us at lunch. Uh, we had a, a nice little lunch place, which eventually got bulldozed, unfortunately, at Irvine. And he would be into a project. I remember one time he was berating all of us because he wanted to solve the four color math problem. And he was totally calling all the physicists and chemists sitting around as to uh, how he was trying to do this and work on it. And I don't know whether you know what that is, but it's got nothing to do with neutrinos. So uh -huh. therefore I kept it quiet. <laughs> Well, no, you can. <laughs> All right. Well, it, unless anybody else has something to say, uh, maybe we ought to. Ever, yeah, does anyone ever um, have any other questions or comments before we close out? There was another discovery we just made, I might say. My wife, Ruth, who is up uh, in, on the screen watching these uh, whole uh, sessions here, and I, and Roberta, who you just heard from, who's running all of this, they sort of knew each other uh, from what 20 years ago or when they were both uh, at the same school in Ridgewood. Uh, Roberta was a librarian and Ruth was teaching at that time. So we were making all kinds of discoveries uh, unexpected uh, on a regular basis around here. Oh, it's such a small world. It's wonderful. We have yeah. a, a comment from Mark to everyone. Neutrinos, they are very small. They have no charge and have no mass and they don't interact at all. One second. Oh, this is that, a long that's one. the poem by. Uh, if, oh, yeah, this is OK. Everyone take a look in the chat. Mark has written a uh, this poem to everybody. That's wonderful. It's in the book. <laughs> okay. Excellent. OK, even better. <laughs> uh, where is uh OK chat room? Well, never mind. You I can want... mm -hmm. go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Um, there, there was a poem about it. It, erroneously at the time. It was written only three or four years after their discovery. Uh, the poem says they have no mass at all. But in fact, it was in 2015 that the prize, the Nobel Prize was given for uh, learning that they do have mass because of uh, a, a matter of something called oscillation, where they can, a single, 
I guess it's a single particle. Hank, you'll correct me if I'm wrong, but it's a, a single particle has the three flavors, the ingredients of either a, a tau, mu, or an electron. Uh, and uh, the, uh, they, as it's traveling, a, a single particle can sort of yield to favor the vanilla flavor or the chocolate flavor or the strawberry flavor, flavor. I don't think anybody understands how exactly or why it happens, but that's how you can identify the variations. But it's really all a, a common single particle. Did I get that right, Hank? Fair. <laughs> well, okay. Leonard, Leonard, when we were talking about this project in Johannesburg uh, in the 60s, and I was trying to, you know, asking my physics teacher about, uh, the, I was in my residency, uh, asking him about the neutrino. He described it as a small particle of vanishingly small mass and no charge. And I felt that description actually to this day conveys the image to me of what it is. I don't know what Hank would say to that. Yeah, yeah that's, that's very good. Okay. Not, not, come on. Not vanishing to zero, but vanishingly small. You know, so. And we don't know the mass of each of these particles. We haven't identified a, a figure. Uh, so we're still learning. Uh, and uh, there is the resonance of what's going on today about respect for science. And uh, I guess uh, getting through the COVID issue has it still is a, a matter of what the latest science says. All right, so we won't get into political issues or any other. Uh, that's part uh, two. <laughs> okay, uh, Roberta. I, I wanted to remind everybody we do have about eight copies left of Chasing the Ghost here at the library. So if you'd like to swing by and pick one up, just send me an email. You can respond to the reminder email I had sent with the Zoom link. Just reply to that email, give me your name, and when you'd like to stop by, and I'll have a copy of the book at the reference desk with your name on it. So the first eight people who respond, I would be happy to, to uh, share that with you. Let, let me amend it slightly. Some of you will not be able to stop by very easily if you're in California or in uh, uh, who knows where. Uh, but uh, I will uh, be happy to mail a copy, uh, Roberta, uh, to yeah, perfect. whoever uh, writes to you and make, wonderful. make that request. Thank you. That's wonderful. Okay. Well, thank you all. Uh, for me, it's been a great pleasure and uh, seeing several faces that I know and a few people that I hadn't known until now. Glad to see you. Yeah. This was such a, um, I mean, it was, I think Lou said earlier that you really added the humanity you know, the music and the whimsical stories and the humor, it's just, you know, for those of us who are not really inclined to science, you really did make it so accessible. And um, I just thank you for, for adding that twist with your writing. It's really wonderful. I, I look forward to like fully reading it now. Um, and I thank each of you. This was such, a, such an interesting conversation. I, I love that you all have so much history and just a sharing of memories and knowledge. So that added so much to this program. So. Thank you, Leonard, for a really well thought out, well planned, very interesting program. Um, and uh, I just thank all of you for spending time with us tonight. And I'll be sending a recording uh, probably late tomorrow afternoon. So um, it'll be on our YouTube channel. So I'll send that link out to you. OK. Probably right after the technical glitch. <laughs> OK. OK. Thank you so much. Thanks. Good evening. OK. Well. Hi, Leonard. Thanks very much. It was my pleasure, my thrill, actually. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, I love that you're so. So, whenever you're ready, you can yeah. Just, yeah.